Hello everyone, welcome back to my show, The Interview. I'm Susan Lee McDonald. They say that life is full of agony, despair, and suffering. But the teachings of Buddha are here to help us see who we are and relieve us of our suffering. 2,600 years ago, Buddha came to tell so many people about how to escape this life. And I think that we have so much to learn from our guest today. Today we're going to meet, in time for Buddha's birthday, the amazing Hungarian monk Chang'an Sinim. He is going to tell us all about where Buddhism is headed, and it's headed apparently to Hungary too. So we'll find out all about Hungary and the Buddhist movement there today here on The Interview. The blue-eyed monk Chang'an Sinim left his homeland to come to Korea to learn the teachings of Buddha. In 1993, he realized his calling from the teachings of Sunsan Sinim, also known as the Dharma of Korea, and he boarded a plane to Korea. Three years later, he was appointed a monk, and he focused on practice and meditations for six years. Then, in 2000, he returned to his native country of Hungary to share his knowledge and wisdom regarding Korean Buddhism. He is spreading Korean Buddhism to foreigners as the founder and chief monk at Wongwangsa, the first Korean Buddhist temple ever to be built in Europe. Hello, welcome to Hwagyesa. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. I'm so glad to finally be here at Hwagyesa. And I'm wondering if there's something special that I need to do to kind of, you know, keep the uh, the honor and pay respects to, the, you know, the of folks course. being here. Please okay. proceed. And we bow in the center line. And do that with me as okay. we as we cross. And I open the door for you. There you go. Yeah. So Susan, yes. let me show you the traditional form of respect, which okay. is three bows okay. before the altar. So we say Puchanyi Map Hesambe, but okay. originally it means one bow, mm -hmm. the Buddha, mm -hmm. the other, the Dharma, and then the Sangha. So okay. the teacher, the teaching, and the students' assembly. Okay. So let me show you the full form. It starts okay. with a standing bow, uh, then the first, and after the third, there is a small finishing bow. And it stops with a standing bow as well. You okay. may or may not use your hands depending on what kind of knees and you know f physical problems okay. you may or may not have, but uh, it doesn't add or subtract from the value of the bows. What's most important mm -hmm. is the mind that you have during the bows. Okay. So when you bow, the meaning of it is mm -hmm. that your your person, yourself, mm -hmm. becomes much smaller mm -hmm. and less significant than mm -hmm. the Buddha, that is your Buddha nature. Okay. So this move means that you actually raise the Buddha above yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're humbling yourself. Exactly. Buddha. In fact, if you do this right, yourself disappears mm -hmm. and only the Buddha remains. So why don't we okay. try this together? Okay. okay. And the small one, very good. This, this bow is really important because, it, like I said, if not just mm -hmm. your body bows, but mm -hmm. your mind bows, mm -hmm. the result is what we call Hashim. Hashim. Hashim, okay. low mind or humble mind. Mm -hmm. This humility is really important, and not just before uh, teachers and uh, you know, seniors. Mm -hmm. It's really important before 
your own Buddha nature so that mm. none of your karma could become stronger. Mm. None of our arrogance would think faster and more than mm -hmm. our Buddha nature would perceive mm -hmm. or could digest. It's okay. really important. This, this humility is not some kind of moral or social attitude. It translates mm -hmm. into that as well. But mm -hmm. primarily you become humble because you see that there's something much, much greater mm -hmm. than you ever thought of as yourself. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's your true self. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that you've ever conceived of so far. Mm -hmm. So our false notion of self, which is the ego, mm -hmm has to disappear mm -hmm. by going lower and lower and lower. Mm -hmm. And our true notion of our true self, which is our Buddha nature, has to go higher and higher and higher. And that's what the bows do. And there's a lot of wonderful side effects mm -hmm. like clearing up your energy path, mm -hmm. giving you good uh, breathing, etc., mm -hmm. etc. But it's not as that's important. All secondary, then. It's yeah. all secondary. The mental aspect mm -hmm. is primary. Mm -hmm. Because you take your mind with you when you leave, mm -hmm. but you leave your body here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ultimately, that's what happens to all of us. I shall free my mind from greed, anger, and ignorance and replace them with the clean Buddhist precepts, the tranquil state of samadhi and bright wisdom. So, Sunim, I want to ask you about the first European Korean Buddhist temple uh, that you've set up in your home country, Hungary. How did that come about, and uh, especially in a country so ma with so many Catholics? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when you train yourself in Korea, mm -hmm. among other monks, and your teacher teaches you something really wonderful, you wonder how you could put that into the West and how you could uh, help other people with that. So my intention with that was, uh, in fact, manifold. One is, to have a home for Sunims, because mm -hmm. if monks and nuns uh, should live uh, in some other places than temples, then uh, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Then if we live together, we practice together, mm -hmm. then that energy can attract a lot of people who can benefit from that. We really do not try to build a museum or a tourist site, etc., uh, etc. Et it's mm -hmm. nothing external. Mm -hmm. But once we construct a temple, we want it to be in a good place, mm -hmm. We want it to look authentic, and we want to use it in the fullest original sense. Mm -hmm. And then, so the uh, traditional uh, buildings that look very similar to this, we can find in Hungary too. Yes, you can. Wow! <laughs> you should see when Koreans visit. Some mm -hmm. of them have their nunmo, their tears coming out because it really does look Korean. Interesting. They really feel like back home, although it's wow. eight thousand kilometers away. Wow! And in Hungary, of all places. It is <laughs> in the mountains, mm -hmm. traditional style, practicing chamsan. Mm -hmm. So that is very rare. Wow. That's so interesting. So, yeah. tell me what the meaning of Wan Guang Sa is. Wan Guang is, means original light and Sa okay. is temple. So, one original, Guang mm -hmm. is light. Mm -hmm. We all have our Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. We all have our potential for enlightenment. That's our original light inside of us. Okay. And if we just clear our karma just a little bit, we can bring this original light out. In other words, we can wake up, we can get enlightenment. And how did you come up with that name? Was that something that your, uh, your master or teacher had said that you should do, or did it come spontaneously? No, actually, Sung San Sim never wanted anybody to follow his words or his practice form huh. or the way he moved or walked or talked. He never wanted that. That's why he was huh. a great teacher. Mm. That name also came up spontaneously after mm. some search. And when the land was found, soon after that, the name was found. Mm. So I don't know how I was, I was having this question, what kind of name should I, we give to the temple? Mm -hmm. And then one moment during a retreat, a 90 day retreat, mm -hmm. it just came and it got stuck, it's there. Interesting. No. Uh, now, how did you find this location? Well, first of all, I should start with my uh, Unsa Sunim, Sung San Sunim, how he related to this. Mm -hmm. He said, you can practice in any place, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So that's number one important. You can practice anywhere, mm -hmm. but once you build a temple, you should find the correct location when nature's energy supports human energy. Hmm. Huh. So he said, don't learn too much from books. Mm. Go and visit temples in Korea and see why they are there. Mm -hmm. I did exactly that. I brought his teaching and my experience together. Yes. And we were looking for this place for over one year. Ah. Okay. And we had several locations to look at. Then on the way out, I noticed this valley. Mm -hmm. 
And I went to the, to the center of this valley, looked around, and I said, wow. Then a little meditation. Then it became very clear. Then I brought out the Sangha wow. so, so that they could see it and mm -hmm. feel it. And we said, yes, we try. What are some of the challenges that you faced in having your own temple that you've been kind of operating and starting from the beginning? You see, uh, let's start again with the spiritual challenges. Mm -hmm. Just like before, we talked about spiritual capital. The spiritual challenge is how to keep your mind clear always, all the time. Mm. No matter what kind of letter you open from the local government, mm -hmm. or what your lawyer tells you as the next hurdle, mm -hmm. or what donations came in and did not come in, mm -hmm. things like that. So, this is not just a construction project. Mm. In other words, you have to have your inside temple intact so that you could build the outside temple. And when you say the inside temple, you're actually meaning just where my heart is. Exactly. Okay. And that inside temple is clean if you can refrain from producing dualistic thoughts and emotions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your own opinions, your own reactions, mm -hmm. your own views contaminate the mm -hmm. mind space or at mm -hmm. least fill up the mind space that you should use mm -hmm. to help others to mm -hmm. stay clear mm -hmm. and to re reflect things and reflect uh, relationships as they are. So in other words, let's say for most lay people like myself, if I encounter a challenging situation, the temptation to get frustrated, get angry, get upset um, when things don't go in a way that I feel is, is best, then that internal balance is kind of broken and then it takes me some time to kind of regroup, re rebalance myself and then act uh, instead of reacting. Is that kind of what you mean by Pretty by much, holding? pretty much, but let's go yeah. one layer deeper. Okay. For most people, and I don't distinguish between Sunims and lay people in, mm -hmm. in that regard, for most people, this balance has never been put on a, ro on a strong foundation. Mm. So it's been put on some education, mm -hmm. on some material well-being, on some appreciation from your friends, mm -hmm. etc. But when this comes to test and you're in a deep crisis or you just have to open a bad letter or you get a bad phone call because mm -hmm. uh, somebody hammers you or threatens the project or mm -hmm. some legal hurdles come up, mm -hmm. then how strong is your foundation? Is mm -hmm. it quicksand mm -hmm. or rock? Mm -hmm. So if you can put your mind in a non-dualistic foundation, then it's closer to mm -hmm. a rock than quicksand. Mm -hmm. And the life tests you mm -hmm. how really strong your clarity is, mm -hmm. how strong your compassion is, how strong your wisdom is. And these mm -hmm. tests mm -hmm. actually prove whether you have an inside temple mm -hmm. in your heart mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. You cannot build an outside temple only. Mm -hmm. You have to have one inside. And when you do, mm -hmm. then the thing happens outside. Wangguangsa International Zen Temple is situated in the heart of the Carpathian Basin in Hungary, where the Carpathian Mountains encircle the fertile plains of the Danube and Tisza rivers. Chang'an Sinim oversaw the entire construction project, from purchasing the land to the actual construction to build this temple, the first of its kind in Europe. After five long years of hard work, Wangguangsa finally opened its doors and is propagating the teachings of Korean Buddhism. How did you decide to become a Buddhist monk? We know that it's not typical for most people, whether they're Eastern, Western, Asian, African American, to become um, a monk. And I'm curious, what was the impetus for you to become one? You know, that impetus was just one big surprise. Mm. It was a, a thought, mm -hmm. an unprecedented and very clear thought echoing in my consciousness in 1992, mm. spring, when I graduated from university. Mm -hmm. Sung San Sunim visited uh, Budapest the year before, mm. and we connected really at that time in 91 April. He had a Dharma talk with mm -hmm. questions and answers and a meditation workshop the following day. Okay. And I was present at both, asked him questions mm. you know, personally, and then he answered. So that kind of sealed my affiliation to his teaching. Now, had you ever read anything about Buddha before, or were you uh, religious in, uh, or spiritual in some way prior to that? No, actually, I, uh, I, I read precious little about Buddhism. Mm -hmm. I knew about Tibetan Buddhism, mm -hmm. like the Nyingma version, the old uh, school. And I did some yoga prior to that. Mm -hmm. But that sentence in 1992 April was just one thing. After I finished the class at the high school, mm -hmm. looked at the empty courtyard and the blue sky and the green trees, 
how wonderful it would be to become monk this lifetime. So you had a question in your mind? No, kind of that's the point. That's why it was such a surprise. Huh. I didn't have to think about what to do with my life. I was graduating from a top-notch university in Budapest, two majors, going on for post-grad, you know, mm -hmm. uh, course for uh, be becoming a pro. Mm -hmm. And I had a golden life. I lived uh, in my own room. I had no uh, immediate difficulties. I had tasks, but no crises. So why, why think about that? I was a happy lay Buddhist. Huh with hair, with a car, <laughs> with, <hair. laughs> with an apartment, mm -hmm. with a job soon come. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was no reason mm. to think about that, but it came. Why? Because it was time for that to come. So wow. I finished my postgrad, you know, thesis, mm -hmm. etc. And then I uh, actually wanted to try what it means mm -hmm. to become monk. And in our tradition, that means that you sit 90 day retreats. Mm -hmm. And I sat one and then it became sealed. That really? was two years later. In 94, I set a 90-day retreat in the West. And uh, that was when I said to myself, this is my life. Mm -hmm. I want to do this. Wow. So then I asked permission from Sung San Sanim. Yeah. Well, crystal clear. Mm. Crystal clear as much as you can make that clear at age 28. Mm -hmm. You can. Mm. But uh, what comes as part of your monk life, you never know. Mm. But then... Um, there must have been a lot of other things that happened in that time that you had to just kind of get rid of. You had to get rid of your your room. You had to get rid of uh, all the earthly kind of material belongings. Well, I could leave behind my home because mm. I never lived independently. In the 80s, you know, uh, most Hungarian youth lived in their parents' house, which mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about schools because I finished all of them. I didn't start a new life. Mm -hmm. I was never married. Mm -hmm. I didn't have at that time a, a girlfriend. So mm -hmm. no problem. Wow. So wow. That, was, that was already sealed by the time I took precepts. Mm -hmm. All of that got uh, cleared. And only these days do students take loans. In my time, people didn't have to take loans to finish higher education. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I was debt free. Wow. How did your parents react to your decision to becoming a Buddhist monk? Uh, I imagine that uh, mm -hmm. no one in your family previously was Buddhist? No. <laughs> At least not this lifetime. Yes. I think my mom had a little touch of Asia. Maybe my dad too. Mm -hmm. anyway. And yeah. how, did, how did they react to your news of telling them that you were choosing this for yourself? First of all, they just couldn't believe it. Mm. They just couldn't believe that their son... Mm -hmm. And only son, yes. And only son. Mm fresh off university got just grabbed by something unknown mm -hmm. so as i said i had been living in my parents house prior to my going to america mm -hmm. and uh, that was like almost four years mm -hmm. and i was practicing zen so my dad used to ask me he was a top-notch scientist medical professor um why are you practicing this thing which even i don't understand <laughs> so i said dad you know, I explained this to you so many times. We, we always got into an argument, mm -hmm. and I really don't want to argue with you anymore. Just mm -hmm. please watch my life, mm -hmm. and if you see that I make a mistake, let me know, and mm -hmm. I'll try to correct it. Mm -hmm. So his argument ceased, completely stopped. Wow. But when I became monk, everything turned dark for him because mm -hmm. that was not the future he imagined for his only son. Right, he's thinking that you would become very successful in society or yeah. whatever work you're doing. Yeah. And and, and uh, nice, nice wife, couple mm -hmm. of kids, etc. Et so that was in store for mm -hmm. him, he thought. Now, mm -hmm. what's important is that in 1997, they visited Korea. Uh -huh. They met Sung San Sunim. Mm -hmm. My dad had a half an hour conversation with him in English wow. while my mom was looking at it and, and listening. Mm -hmm. And they came out totally satisfied with what they heard and saw wow. and I took two weeks to take them around Korea mm -hmm. so they saw that their son was not entering some crazy cult or mm -hmm. some some weird religion mm -hmm. their son is actually happy and mm -hmm. respected and successful to the necessary you know extent so that they would feel that I'm integrated here mm -hmm. but when I went home in, in 2000 my dad just still couldn't believe you know <laughs> that this is going on for the last seven years Did or so. Did he think it was a phase or something? Yeah, that, he thought that it was a phase. maybe just for a few years. And then I said, and I said, Dad, I became a teacher. He said, yeah, but why can't you get a wife for yourself? You know? <laughs> I said, Dad, I could get a wife. Mm -hmm. I have all the instruments for it. <laughs> but I don't intend to. And he says, why? Mm -hmm. And then I said to him, Dad, there's enough kids on the earth. Mm -hmm. And I love kids and they love mm -hmm. me, but I don't want mine. Mm -hmm. 
I'm interested in a, not a quantity mm -hmm. increase, but a quality increase. Mm -hmm. So this kind of stuff. And then after a couple of years, my mom was able to say, if you're happy, mm -hmm. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. But my dad passed away uh, 12 years ago. And I'm sorry. Until, yeah. until his dying day, mm -hmm. he couldn't really accept that I did mm -hmm. this. That's all right, and I, and I had heart-to-heart -heart conversations with him about it, but what he had to understand mm -hmm. that when sons become independent, they choose their own direction. Sure. And I can't live his life. Right. I can live only my life. Right. Now, has yeah. she come to visit you uh, in your temple, or does Many she maybe, times. has she decided to maybe live there with you? No, no, no. No? Uh, she lives in her own private space in Budapest mm -hmm. next to the old family apartment, mm -hmm. which is good for her mm -hmm. and good for me and good for the temple. Mm -hmm. It's great. Mm -hmm. What uh, she came to respect is our tradition, mm -hmm. partly because I never wanted her to follow it. Mm. Why not? Because it would be the same intrusion into her life as mm. my father's wish was into my life. Uh. So I don't want to make people dependent on my decisions. Mm -hmm. I help them if mm -hmm. necessary. But I will not tell my mom what to do. Mm -hmm. If she asks, mm -hmm. I answer. If mm -hmm. she requests, I fulfill that request mm -hmm. to the best of my abilities. But I'll never tell her, Mom, I'm a Buddhist monk, so you should practice Buddhism too. Mm -hmm. That's a no. Mm -hmm. I degrade the whole thing before mm -hmm. her eyes. Mm -hmm. No way. Do you know of any, um, any time in that period where you thought to yourself, I'm not sure if I made the right decision? Uh, that never came in Korea. Mm -hmm. Because for six years you're embedded in this temple environment, mm -hmm. you're kind of nurtured like a mm -hmm. new baby in the womb. Mm -hmm. And when your teacher makes you a teacher, which happened in 1999, then uh, there's no further doubt because your teacher kind of seals it and says, okay, mm -hmm. go do your job. Mm -hmm. After all, that's what you came here for. You mm -hmm. have a kind of natural kind of talent for this. So why don't you teach what you learned and mm -hmm. what you think of as precious? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I never really had that doubt whether mm -hmm. I made the right decision, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that I didn't have difficulties. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are human beings, mm -hmm. we are in this human body, mm -hmm. difficulties come. Sometimes mm -hmm. very nice and beautiful difficulties, mm -hmm. sometimes very ugly and impersonal difficulties. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, they are there. Mm -hmm. So if they don't kill you, they make you stronger. But there was never a doubt yeah. whether I did the right thing or not. What it was about Buddhism that appealed to you um, in the early stages that made you decide that you wanted to become a monk? So mm -hmm. when they say, you follow the path, you get enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's all I needed. Whenever mm -hmm. that happens, mm -hmm. whenever that enlightenment happens, mm -hmm. I don't care. But mm -hmm. as long as we follow the path to the mm -hmm. same direction, someday it will happen. So it teaches people to be totally one with the mm -hmm. world, integrated into society mm -hmm. in their various capacities, but spiritually independent. Mm. I love it. I love it. I, to the present day, this is the best mm -hmm. you know, pattern and the best framework mm -hmm. I can imagine for anything spiritual. You mentioned the importance of, of the, the independence that you feel yeah. with this path. And of the many, many things that Buddha has said, is there something in particular that you can say is one of the most moving things for you yeah. that he said? Just before he died, he said that, monks, this world is on fire. Strive endlessly. Strive endlessly? Yeah. Strive for what? Strive for your own awakening because mm -hmm. you have very limited time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't threatening people. He was warning people that this life is very short, mm -hmm. very transient. Mm -hmm. And this world is on fire means it's impermanent. Mm -hmm. Strive endlessly means do something with your consciousness because mm -hmm. if you're reborn with the same kind of mind as mm -hmm. what you brought here, mm -hmm. that's a zero. Mm -hmm. You didn't do anything except consume food, energy, and mm -hmm. uh, no sunshine and rain. But what do you do with your mind? Mm -hmm. What do you do with your consciousness? Mm -hmm. So strive endlessly means never think it's over. Mm -hmm. Never think that you got the great awakening because mm -hmm. that kind of notion mm -hmm. poisons you. Mm -hmm. Awakening wakes you up, mm -hmm. but if you react to it intellectually that I got it, mm -hmm. that poisons you and takes you to hell. So, so strive he, endlessly means just that. So is he also referring to just uh, a, a, conscious, uh, a conscious decision to elevate the consciousness? So to, to not just be content with uh, the, the externals or just even, you know, a nice life, but to truly kind of work on oneself and be aware, to truly be self-aware. Is that what he's meaning? So you look at your own character, you find a lot of things you don't want to face. Yes. But the first thing you do is face them, mm -hmm. see them for what they are. Then you stop feeling so good and bad about yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you see how your habits are formed. Mm -hmm. 
and you can see these entry points mm -hmm. and exit points, how you can change these habits mm -hmm. and turn yourself into something else. Mm -hmm. The choice is always ours, except sometimes we don't see these choices. Mm -hmm. And then we blame something or someone else. Mm -hmm. She made me do this. He made me do this. Mm -hmm. It made me whatever. Mm -hmm. So we love to blame the world, mm -hmm. the exterior and society, mm -hmm. because we became what we became, mm -hmm. negative. Mm -hmm. Nobody did these things to you. Mm -hmm. You invited them to yourself. Mm -hmm. You made conscious decisions mm -hmm. to become the person you are. Right. So if we regain this kind of spiritual independence, mm -hmm. because that's where this question started, mm -hmm. then we stop blaming others. We stop blaming the world. We see cause and effect. Mm -hmm. How the world and us interact. Mm -hmm. How we use other people's decisions to mm -hmm. create the character that we are. Mm -hmm. So it's not us as a single person, as an individual creating everything, because that's another wrong mm -hmm. view but it's a complete interaction mm -hmm. with the world mm -hmm. that creates this moment for us. Mm -hmm. And we should see our part, what is our part mm -hmm. in it, what we do, what we are responsible mm -hmm. for, and that gives us the spiritual independence, which results in more complete and harmonious mm -hmm. cooperation with the world and other people. Great. With many doubts and questions overwhelming him, a blue-eyed young man met a Korean Buddhist monk one fateful day and realized his calling. He followed the monk halfway across the world to learn more about Korean Buddhism. Three years later, the young man became a monk and was given the name Chang'an. Chang'an Sinim has been spreading the teachings and wisdom of Korean Buddhism by following his teacher's footsteps and traveling all over Europe, including Austria, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. His top priority, just as it was for his teacher, Sunsan Sinim, is to teach his audience how to look into their own minds. Can you tell me a little bit about this place? I'm seeing these various uh, statues of sorts. What, this what is, is this? a memorial garden. Ah, this okay. is Kobong Sunim's uh, Chumotap. Okay. And uh, he was Sungsan Sunim's Unsa Sunim. What does that mean? Uh, father monk or okay. principal teacher. Okay. I'd love to learn a little bit more about your teacher, uh, Sungsan Sunim. Uh, what type of person was he? He and was. He was a great and really for us fully enlightened Zen master mm -hmm. with a lot of strength and humor. Mm -hmm. He was really hard on himself, you know, practicing. He always required himself to practice more than others. Mm. And uh, for us, he exhibited all the features of a great master whom we could follow. Mm. And I feel very fortunate that I could meet him and I owe him everything. And with Sung San Sinim, mm. you were with him for how long? I should say I met him in Hungary in 1991 mm -hmm. and until uh, I last saw him in this life in 2003 mm -hmm. there was no single year that either I wouldn't meet him mm -hmm. or attend a retreat mm -hmm. where he was present mm -hmm. but the principal time when we uh, were under the same roof was right here at Huagesa between 1994 and 2000. So those six years were the most important mm -hmm. and most formative six years and mm -hmm. we knew it. Mm -hmm. Everybody who stayed with him. Because mm -hmm. he stopped traveling in 93, 94, mm -hmm. especially to the West. Mm -hmm. He had a couple of more uh, trips to Hong Kong and Singapore. Mm -hmm. But he essentially stopped traveling in, in 93, 94. Mm -hmm. Then he started to come up to the Zen Center, mm -hmm. to the fourth floor of the Teja Kwanjong building, mm -hmm. and gave us daily Kongan teaching. Now wow. that's priceless. I'd love to see a little bit more of these these uh, kind of monuments. Now, is this uh, a typical? I don't think I've seen one that has so many kind of circular discs. N me neither. Before. Look, Susan, <laughs> this is the most unconventional yeah. uh, chumotap or saritap that yeah. you could ever think of. Yeah. You know, so this is the symbol of of universal substance, mm -hmm. which you attain when your lotus of enlightenment. You see that mm -hmm. petaled lotus before that. Yeah. Uh, underneath. So when that opens, mm -hmm. you attain substance, mm -hmm. our true self. Mm. 
So sometimes it's held by lions, like the effort mm -hmm. on Kobongsin, but here it's lotuses. And below that, the kind of three levels, the three major mm -hmm. levels of body, speech, and mind. Mm -hmm. That's how I interpret it. But many okay. people can have various other I mm -hmm. ideas about it. But frankly enough, never a pagoda like this, with the circles and this kind of very smooth mm -hmm. and round, you know, octagonal shape, one and two. Mm -hmm. So I really wouldn't like to go into it too much, what mm -hmm. it may mean. I just thank you, Kunsunim. I bow to it. And that's it. Thank you so much for your hard work and practice, sir, and your teaching. Thank you. You know, I'm looking at this uh, amazing monument here, and I'm curious if you can explain to me a little bit about this, because you mentioned the don't know mm -hmm. and uh, don't think, and I see these inscriptions right here. <laughs> Only don't know. Only doing it, yeah. Yeah. I can't explain to you. Mm. Not because I cannot read it. I can't read it, but that's not the reason why I cannot explain to you. Mm. Can you see your own eyes? Only in a mirror. That's not your eyes. Mm. It's this physical object. Mm. That's not your seeing. Mm. Can you hear your ears? Mm. No. I don't think so. By thinking, can you get to your true self? Mm. Yeah. Now, I would like you to perceive the sounds. Mm. When you perceive the sounds, there is no thinking. And ultimately, you and this world can become one if you mm -hmm. perceive the sounds deep enough. That's what Quan Se Um means, mm -hmm. perceive the sound of the world. So what do you hear right now? Aside from the truck coming up the road. That's, per that's perfectly enough. Yeah. So you hear a vehicle coming up. Mm -hmm. What else? The birds. Exactly. The movement of mm -hmm. the feet on the, on the gravel. Mm -hmm. So if you perfectly attain the sound, you also attain where the sound comes from. Mm -hmm. And as the Chinese wisdom used to say, you find the bull on which you are already sitting. Mm. No one can explain don't know, mm. but you can perceive it because that's what perceives. So if you guide the sounds back to the mm -hmm. source of hearing, mm -hmm. you attain. Mm. You guide vision back to the place of seeing, you attain. Mm. When you were with Sung San Sanim, I imagine that you had many, many questions. Yeah. Uh, and how could you describe your relationship to Sung San Sanim? In what regard do you hold him? Well, it's like small duck following a big duck. You know, when you are spiritually born, mm -hmm. then your little eggshell of yourself is it cracks and you mm -hmm. see this first big thing right next to you, mm -hmm. which is the big duck. And then you big duck follows small duck. That's it. <laughs> that was the relationship. Look, Sung San Sunim never let anybody become quote unquote his friend. Mm. He had spiritual friends, mm -hmm. uh, other Korean monks, but I'm talking about the students, mm. not even his elder students. They, nobody was buddy buddying with mm. him. So nobody was running into his room for tea or personal favors. Mm -hmm. When they had a problem, they saw him personally. When they mm -hmm. had some big changes, they saw him personally. When they just wanted to share something deep or have mm -hmm. some personal question, also saw him personally. Therefore, I saw him average once or twice every year, one-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one, mm -hmm. outside of the public you know, teaching mm -hmm. situation, for longer than 10-15 minutes. Mm. But those conversations were pivotal. Mm -hmm. They were extremely and utmost mm -hmm. importance, you know. So uh, meeting him was, uh, was nothing that you can 100% put into words, but the presence of a great teacher gives mm -hmm. you a lot of security and challenge at the mm -hmm. same time, direction and questions mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. and it shakes your karma 100%. Mm. So why you can uh, trust a teacher because everything that you have as a homework appears, mm -hmm. And the presence of the teacher and the question answers, they help you solve it. Mm. The teacher doesn't take away your homework, mm. doesn't take away your karma, doesn't solve your karma mm -hmm. for you. But his presence and his clear mind, his mm -hmm. compassionate, wise and strong, mm -hmm. powerful mind helps you solve your karma, mm. helps keep your direction clear. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I'm eternally grateful mm -hmm. to him. How did he come up with the name Tongan Sinim? Well, just like with any other Dharma name, he looks at the person mm -hmm. and sees the potential and the homework at the same time. And what does that mean? So Malgul Chong Chanunancha means okay. clear eyes. Uh -huh. And is it because you have blue eyes that he gave well, you? Well, the Malgul, you know, mm -hmm. can be blue mm -hmm. if it's Parun Chong Cha, but mm -hmm. if it's Malgul Chong Cha, then it's clear. So if I don't do my job, it's just blue. But uh -huh. if I do my job, it becomes 
clear. Okay. <laughs> so I think he just spurred me to that direction uh -huh. to see clearly. Mm. But if you know there's another Dharma name, then you can get to the same mm -hmm. you know uh, principle, the same mm -hmm. substance through some other Dharma meaning. Mm -hmm. But he gave me this because that's my path. Mm. See clearly. Never let your vision, mm -hmm. your perception be clouded by anything, anyone, anytime. Mm -hmm. And he made one kulcha, one calligraphy mm -hmm. for me, which is mu mm -hmm. don't move. Don't move. Yeah. You know, so that's non-action huh. original. That's the wu way in Chinese. It's, it's non-action. Mm. But what that means, your mind should never move. Huh. Is that possible? Of course. That your mind does, doesn't move? Yes, it's possible. Huh. But you think? It moves. Hmm. Not thinking <laughs> doesn't move. <laughs> so if I just decide not to think, well, then we couldn't do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Maybe I can't become a Buddhist because I need to be able to think to do my there's, job. There's one no? more step. There's one more step. You, sh you can, and if you like, mm -hmm. you will become a Buddhist. Mm. But this not moving mind is the foundation, like this space in which objects appear. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you do is Wei Wu Wei, or acting non-action, mm -hmm. or moving not moving. Okay. I know this is a little paradoxical. Mm -hmm. So you can keep an unmoving mind, a non-dualistic clear foundation, while you are dealing with good and bad, moving, mm -hmm. coming, going, etc. Mm -hmm. And once you have some meditation experience, you will attain and understand mm -hmm. what it means. But just for the conventional, rational thinking, it's paradoxical mm -hmm. because it's not logical, mm -hmm. luckily. <laughs> it's paradoxical mm -hmm. and not logical. So that you could only experience it, the concepts only lead up to it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you anything. Mm. It just leads you up to the threshold. And there's a great saying, if you want to enter the gate of Zen, mm -hmm. do not give rise to thinking. Mm. There we are. Okay. Where do you think you would be right now had you never met Sung San Sanim? This is a question I equally cannot answer like don't know, because I don't know. Mm. Because I have no idea mm -hmm. where my life could have gone. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but I'm fortunate enough that it led me here, mm -hmm. not somewhere else. Yeah. Sung San Sanim became the first Korean Buddhist monk to propagate the wisdom of Buddhism in the West, and his teachings inspired countless foreigners. <laughs> Sung San Sanim was known as one of the four incarnations of Buddha in the world. His teachings are being passed on by his students worldwide. I know that obviously you speak fluent English and of course your native tongue is Hungarian and you've had to learn Korean. It's not an easy language for a lot of people to acquire. How did you decide to learn Korean? Well, anybody who says that Korean is not difficult really just doesn't have eyes and ears and, <laughs> you know, thinking. Korean is a very complex language mm -hmm. and it's wonderful to learn it. Mm. First of all, when I got here, uh, I had significantly more important jobs than studying language, mm -hmm. but I realized that if I don't speak the language, basically I can't even be a housemaster because I can't do basic shopping down there at Suyushijang. Mm -hmm. So at the market, <laughs> exactly. Right. So uh, okay, learn basic Korean. I learned basic Korean mm -hmm. in '95, Ilgup level one. Mm -hmm. Then I realized hmm, this is not really enough. So let's do level two. Mm -hmm. That came in '96. But then I got really busy, and I had temple jobs and there were retreats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go on. In mm -hmm. retrospect, it was a mistake. Yeah. I should have gone to level three and four and whatever, because now I'm studying level three as mm -hmm. we speak. Mm -hmm. It's never too late, but Korean is a wonderful language, totally relationship sensitive, mm -hmm. context based. Yes. And for me, using these various endings and, uh, and trying to relate to people in the correct way is mm -hmm. like playing a symphony. Huh. A symphony, you know. That's a good way to describe yeah. it. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just what kind of instruments mm -hmm. you use at the given mm -hmm. moment, what kind of melody, what kind of composition. Mm -hmm. So that exactly mm -hmm. expresses how close the person is, sure. high and low or level, the importance of the matter mm -hmm. or the personal or impersonal mm -hmm. endings. It's really fantastic to mm -hmm. tune into that. It's a very good mental exercise because you know, Koreans are very pali pali, so you right. have to be spontaneous yes. and fast but you have to be appropriate at the same time. <laughs> yes. So you have about uh, basically six to 10 choices, every given word mm -hmm. or every given 
verb right. can have basically six to ten endings in mm -hmm. any given moment. Mm -hmm. It's your choice to use them. And you now learn uh, Buddhist writings and no, and right? Tests? No, no, no. Come on, I don't have two two and a half <laughs> lifetimes for that. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm, I'm not learning writings mm -hmm. as per Chinese characters mm -hmm. and stuff. But what I'm learning is. Korean Buddhist terminology mm -hmm. and I'm not learning that from books. Mm. I have teachers uh, I really respect, monks yes. I look upon very highly mm -hmm. and of course Sung San Sunim's translations come first mm -hmm. and then I have other monks to enrich mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, this vocab. I'm trying to learn this trade in Korean mm -hmm. out of a, a sense of gratitude, also a sense of more direct relationship mm -hmm. with Korean Buddhists. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Needless to say, when you speak to Koreans in Korean, wow! They respond very positively, they respond don't they? Very, very <laughs> differently than through a translator. Yes. Translators are necessary, and I appreciate all my translators' mm -hmm. jobs, but uh, it's a firewall. Yeah. As you speak Korean, that you really win a lot of people's hearts and minds because it's not an easy language to learn, and the people who come to see you are probably really impressed by the fact that you're trying so hard to to learn Korean. Uh, partially, yes, and of course some of them are less impressed than kind of expecting me to speak better, mm. and that's also very good. Well, to be home in Korea, you have to eat rice, you have to eat kimchi, mm -hmm. and you have to speak Korean. Mm. If you don't, you're not home here. Mm. And that's our spiritual home. So I really enjoy learning that, although I have a lot more to learn. Now, when you've given talks, uh, do people expect you to be speaking Korean, or uh, do they expect you to be speaking English? But there's more and more demand for it, mm -hmm. although I'm far from ready. Mm -hmm. Or Koreans tell me directly, we know you speak Korean, talk to us in Korean. Mm -hmm. Of course, I speak Korean at a bus stop, at, in a restaurant, or in the street, but this very Buddhist, high-class Korean, it mm -hmm. takes more time to learn, yes. but I will. Has there ever been any type of, shall I say, prejudice against you because they think that because you're of a Western origin that you are unable to grasp it quite as well as someone who's Korean? You know, prejudiced people don't really come to my talk, so these two <laughs> folks are really separate. Mm. Let's start with the prejudice. Mm. Prejudice is not bound to uh, eye corner or <laughs> skin color mm -hmm. or social status, right. hair, no hair. Some people in the West also believe we just can't make it as Korean monks, and some people mm -hmm. in Korea also believe that we can't make it as Korean mm -hmm. monks. And I don't care about that too much mm -hmm. as long as I do my job. Mm -hmm. So uh, they really are interested in the white face and the big nose. Mm -hmm. But what they are more <laughs> interested in is whether you know your homework. Mm. So they don't want you to be the biggest spanking Zen master on earth because, in fact, we are not. Mm. But what we can do is use our own very good experience mm -hmm. and our different angle at Korean Buddhism, which is not the traditional angle. We learn the tradition. We appreciate the tradition. We attain as much as possible from the tradition. But we are not Korean. Mm -hmm. We were not born here. So that right. gives us a fresh view, a mm. fresh angle, a fresh approach. Mm -hmm. And that's something Koreans really appreciate. Mm -hmm. So it's very practical. What I'm getting as a review, because uh, talks are everywhere, you can download them, you can mm -hmm. watch them, re-watch them, whatever. They're all over that, YouTube. <laughs> you know, you know when I get this, my grandmother changed her ironing habits. And I said, oh, what does that have to do with my talks? Hmm. Listen, she said, my mom and grandma, mm -hmm. they used to watch television all the time and listen to the sound as radio. Mm -hmm. But your talks are with subtitles. So my grandma put down the iron and started to watch it so that she could read the subtitles. Uh -huh. This never happened in 25 years. Interesting. So, you know, and, then, and then they say, your talks are really practical. Mm. They are really easy to understand. Mm -hmm. It inspires people. Mm -hmm. So I really take it as uh, not just as a credit, because it's not me. Mm -hmm. The whole teaching which uh, I received, the whole practice which uh, I got assistance with, mm -hmm. that all comes together in these talks. It's not really one mouth, you know, mm -hmm. speaking. But uh, what's really important for me is uh, that our teacher, Sung San Sunim, who lived, you know, right in this house for a long time, he taught us, believe in yourself. Mm. But what the self is, is your job to clarify mm. what you are. So that clears away prejudice, that mm -hmm. doesn't let us run high on positive or mm -hmm. negative feedback. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, humbly express my appreciation to his teaching and this mm -hmm. tradition, because without that, this hybrid mm -hmm. wouldn't appear. 
A lot of people search for happiness in external things, right? We search for happiness mm -hmm. in uh, our jobs or in families or that one relationship, you know, that soulmate that's going to give me the happiness. If we accept happiness as a byproduct of our practice mm -hmm. for something higher than happiness or unhappiness, it will come. Mm -hmm. But if we directly want to get it and we strive for this idea of happiness, it always leaves us. Yes. It always becomes transient. It right. somehow never works out. It becomes imperfect, mm -hmm. you know, impermanent, mm -hmm. dependent on something or someone else. Mm -hmm. And unless we realize that that's the way the world works, we'll always get disappointed mm -hmm. and frustrated. And the West, especially the West, but now the East, also. That's why we have so many addicts. Mm. Because we're addicted to some idea of happiness, and if it doesn't work, we mm -hmm. have layer two happiness, layer three mm -hmm. happiness, then chemical happiness, then sensory happiness, mm -hmm. then food happiness, etc., mm -hmm. drug happiness, mm -hmm. whatever. And all the time, all this you know, struggling time, we don't notice mm -hmm. that our fundamentals are not clear. The foundation is not mm -hmm. strong. We don't understand ourselves. We don't understand the world. We don't understand mm -hmm. our relationship. So how could we be happy mm -hmm. in the wrong way? Yeah. But once you find the right way, the correct way, mm -hmm. then naturally happiness appears mm -hmm. as part of a larger balance, mm -hmm. all right? Mm. Today, if there's something that you could say made you happy, what would that be? This interview. <laughs> oh, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been, yeah. it's been so fun talking with you, and I still have a few questions before go we ahead. go. No problem. Uh, you've published a number of books. Uh, you've published um, The Flower and the Bee, The Mirror of One's Soul, what kind of message do you feel you're trying to give to people when they're reading your books or coming to your talks? Just wake up. That's all, people. Wake up while you can. Mm. This life is extremely short. Wake up while you can. Mm. And take that with you mm -hmm. to whatever comes next after mm -hmm. you leave this body. Because mm -hmm. if you just take your own karma, that's mm. pretty gruesome. Mm. We all want a life filled with happiness and pleasure, rather than pain and suffering. And we often seek happiness by fulfilling our materialistic desires. But has that truly made us happy? Chang'an Sinim believes otherwise. So what are some of your plans uh, now and when will you go back to Hungary? This time I go back to Hungary on May 31st uh -huh. and we'll do a 100 day Kido at Wan Kwangsa. Oh wow, so 100 uh, days of prayer. Yeah, a prayer or I would say chanting practice okay. which transforms you. Mm. You know it starts with worship then it stops being mm -hmm. worship. Mm. And uh, that kind of Kido includes the Nungom Ju, mm -hmm. the Shurangama Mantra which is one of the most important mantras in uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Okay and part of our kapung, our tradition in mm -hmm. Korea. And uh, we include the Debiju also, which is the mantra of great compassion mm -hmm. called the Great Dharani. And the various other chants. We do that for 100 days. Mm -hmm. And we will have several short retreats, short meditation retreats mm -hmm. in the meantime. And then for the last week, we'll have a large Korean group visiting. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. I'll be back briefly in Korea in September mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully for the winter retreat which starts uh, in the middle of November. So I, ex I expect to sit three months in one of the uh, Zen halls in Korea which is I think a very important and very deep experience. No matter how people feel about it uh, before or after, mm -hmm. what happens during that time mm -hmm. is irreplaceable for any Sunim. Mm. Last but not least, if you had to describe what Buddha's teachings uh, meant to you and mean to you, how would you say? Wake up and help this world. Mm. That's it. Mm. In short, mm -hmm. nothing is more concise than that. Wake up, attain who you truly are, then attain your correct job, mm. what you came here for when you were born, mm. and use that to help this world. It's been a pleasure to have you on my show, and thank you so much for inviting me to this amazing temple and uh, I'm so glad that you were here in Korea for us to 
do this interview and you've made this interview truly an interview so thank you so much Susan thank you so much for, for having me and I really appreciate your wonderful intelligent questions and your insight mm -hmm. into the interview oh well, thank okay. you so much thank you very much thank you take care